Is this on? Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I guess I have uh, lunch to contend with here, but <laughs> uh, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Thank you, Jeffrey, for hosting us once again here. I'm delighted to be back on Hornby Island and such a beautiful part of the world. Um, so I want to begin at the beginning of uh, Professor Terry Eagleton's book, uh, The Idea of Culture. Um, Terry Eagleton is a professor of English literature, and he writes that, quote, culture is said to be one of the two or three most complex words in the English language, and the term which is sometimes considered to be its opposite, nature, is commonly awarded the accolade of being the most complex of all. Yet, though it is fashionably these days to see nature as a derivative of culture, culture, etymologically speaking, is a concept derived from nature. So in his book, uh, Eagleton unpicks the entangled set of meanings that culture has acquired through history. Although the concept of culture, as he goes on to demonstrate, derives from nature through agriculture and the earliest forms of animal husbandry, the term itself has come to represent a distinctive way of life, artistic and intellectual pursuits far removed from their material origins. And this semantic shift of culture from a material to a manufactured concept could be said to mirror humanity's own progression from rural to urban living, uh, plowing to painting. In its modern conception, however, culture no longer seems to apply to those who cultivate the land. Yet the paradox of this evolution is that nature and culture remain fundamentally dependent on one another. Jeffrey Rubinoff, artist and former farmer, cultural producer and cultivator, epitomizes this dialectic with uncanny precision. Alternately working with land and steel, Rubinoff translates inspirations from the former into sculptures with the latter. He believes that, quote, the artist can bring civilization and humanity into balance with nature. And in his sculpture park, he does just this, placing his art in explicit counterpoint with the geology of the surrounding coasts and mountains and the abundant wildlife that inhabit his land. But Rubinoff's park is not simply a picturesque setting for his work, nor is it simply immediate inspiration. Rubinoff's interest in nature is far more profound. For some years, he has been interested in much larger narratives of natural history, including Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and the discoveries that surrounded the Burgess Shale fossils, which I'll touch on a bit later. So in this presentation, I hope to outline how not, uh, uh, Rubinoff's work not only makes us see our natural surroundings with new eyes, but it also makes visible, visible culture's uh, deep connections to the evolution of humans. Jeffrey Rubinoff's art, as everyone knows, lives in nature. His work is displayed uh, in a rugged landscape, rich with biodiversity, and the sculptures are seen against a mountainous backdrop of the Comox, Comox Valley, although not visible today, unfortunately. Individual pieces are marked by rust brought on by the elements, and lichen and insects colonize the sur sculptural surfaces. Uh, avian wildlife deposit traces that Rubinoff has permitted to remain on the work, and that is a <laughs> slightly more of a euphemism than... <laughs> Um, and as you can see, and what Joan touched on earlier, the, the lichen um, on some of the earlier uh, series in series one here. These natural forces remake in their own subtle way what the artist produced in his studio. And like nature, the work itself uh, is in a state of constant transformation. Rubinoff wants to make these processes of biological and physical, physical weathering visible. But nature does not only act on the work, it is also reflected in the sculpture's shapes, some of which allude to fossilized forms or birds balancing precariously on reeds. What's more, the visual vocabulary of the sculpture park is laden with questions about the interface between humans and the environment, and it enables viewers to see the many connections between landscape and sculpture, and by extension, nature and culture. And as Rubinoff uh, has asked, how can you separate one from the other? Rubinoff compares his own artistic process to early humans' interactions with their environments. And indeed, he understands the making of quote-unquote original art to be analogous to the first discovery and colonization of the wilderness. And as he, as he describes, 
quote, if you're going to deal with unmapped territory, then there's the concept of original art. The artist, both natural hunter and navigator, navigates to a point of the unknown and brings back the rudders of the map of where he's been, and the proof is the work he brings back. Rubinoff uh, does not consider Hornby Island to be a wilderness, but he describes his land as being on, quote, the fringe of the forest and the edge of the wilderness. This outlook reflects how the sculpture park was originally carved out uh, around his home. Following the purchase of the property in 1973, he took, uh, it took years of replanting and reshaping the land uh, to clear the canvas from the previous farm that was left overgrown. In the first few years, Rubinoff farmed clover for seed, which taught him everything he needed to know about the land as he became deeply familiar with the contours of the soil and the layout of the property. And John, who's here as well, can attest to the extensive uh, landscaping that has gone on in this property. Although Rubinoff found the act of farming emotionally exhilarating, he did not see himself only as a farmer. And as he writes, uh, quote, both the hunter and farmer are in my genes. A choice had to be made which would be the dominant in terms of art, and what I saw was the forest person, or the hunter, had to be the choice that the artist made. So farming would always be secondary to the art itself. So Rubinoff's commitment to understanding his own genetic history as artist and farmer re relates to his larger engagement with the writings and values of Darwin and evolutionary theory. Rubinoff perceives his sculptural series as an evolutionary statement, not only in terms of the serial grouping of each piece over the course of the artist's life, but also because the act of creating the work itself is a manifestation of traits such as spatial acuity and the perception of counterpoint that humans evolved over time through natural selection. There are several parallels between Darwin's theory of evolution and Rubinoff's artistic outlook. First, Rubinoff describes the unfolding of his sculptures as a type of argument in which modifications build on and reshape predecessors in his series. This cumulative refinement echoes the directional progress of evolution that leads to, quote, ever more complex and adapted orders of organization. Progress in evolution is, of course, not a single upward climb, but has a trajectory that mixes birth and death, speciation and extinction, resulting in cumulative buildup of complex ad adaptations and improvements that tend, as Darwin put it, to progress towards perfection. And this is precisely the quality to which Rubinoff aspires. He believes that a work of art is, quote, perfection by completeness, and all of his mature work is shaped by the incremental additions and subtractions that enable him to reach it. An important element of progress, both within the artistic tradition and the underlying mechanism of natural selection, is what Darwin called the strong principle of inheritance. Natural selection acts on phenotypes, which are observable traits of an individual, but in order for those traits to change over time, they must be genetically heritable. The manifestation of inheritance in this sculpture park is evidenced directly by the work itself, which is grouped into series or families. And indeed, Rubinoff has revealingly claimed that he was determined that his art would have no orphans. Moreover, Rubinoff considers his knowledge as an artist to have been progressively inherited, such as when he revisited the work of David Smith in the late 1970s. Linking the narrative of evolutionary inheritance with his artistic practice, Rubinoff insists that his obligation and that of the sculpture park is to, quote, pass the values of art inherent in the sculpture park to future generations. Rubinoff continues that, quote, this is an obligation that I recognize in my ability to create original art. This requires an obligation to history itself, as these values are an inheritance of nature. So Rubinoff, as an artist working creatively with form, is also fa fascinated in evolution because this too describes a creative explosion independent of God. For Rubinoff, this creative explosion is manifested above all in the fossils of the Burgess Shale, which are not that far from where we are here today. Discovered in 1909 in the Canadian Rocky Mountains near the town of Field, British Columbia, 
The Burgess Shale Formation is a fossil deposit preserving some of the earliest recorded life on Earth dating back 505 million years during the Cambrian period, a time when almost all life on the planet was contained in the ocean. Originally thought to be simply a well-preserved example of soft shell organisms, Charles Walcott, who first discovered the Burgess Shale fossils, attempted to categorize the organisms he found into existing living taxonomic groups. However, in the early 1960s, scientists reinvestigated these fossils and found that the organisms did not fit contemporary categories of species, revealing much more diverse and unusual life that suggested larger forces of evolution at play. The Burgess Shale fossils are significant from an evolutionary perspective because they provide evidence of the rapid radiation of multicellular life, which scientists believe are ancestors of virtually all extant or extinct life forms on Earth. What's intriguing to me is that for almost two billion years prior to this Cambrian radiation, which represents uh, 88% of Earth's history, there existed only single cell algae and bacteria. In fact, before the episodes of diversification, uh, there were only three animal categories uh, with their variety of external forms. But after this explosion of sorts, there were 38 uh, animal phyla groups, the same number that still exists today. While the Cambrian explosion, as implied by the Burgess fossils, is significant and critical to understanding the past, it can also help scientists understand what might occur in the future through a more refined development of evolutionary theory. And indeed, the recent uncovering of uh, the strange full-bodied structure of Hallucigenia um, just last year, uh, which was a small form, uh, worm-like Burgess fossil, demonstrates that hidden links to our evolutionary past continue to be rediscovered in the Burgess Shale. We're continuing to discover some of earliest life forms. These fossils are now a major Canadian treasure, uh, but they did not fail to inspire Rubinoff. In 1989, some 80 years after the discovery, Rubinoff was beginning a new series in cast steel and plate fabrication when he first encountered the Burgess fossils through Stephen Jay Gould's book, Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History, published that year. Rubinoff was captivated by what he read. In fact, the Burgess Shale began to solve some of the previously intractable puzzles that had riddled his sculptural practice and helped him rethink the very nature of creation itself. As he describes, quote, the meaning of the Burgess Shale to me established that the exploration of form and its rapid evolution with which I was involved as an artist was a phenomenon rooted in nature itself. Rubinoff's discovery of the Burgess fossils marked a renewed interest on his part in evolution, which he soon incorporated into his artistic practice. He's described how uh, Darwin's On the Origin of Species became a handbook for creativity while in the studio during the creation of Series 6. So from here, the Burgess fossils would continue to be a metaphor for Rubinoff, as evidenced by his 1997 solo exhibition in New York entitled Evolution, Steel, Art, History, and the Cambrian Explosion, uh, which were a collection of eight sculptures from Series 6. Rubinoff's preoccupation with evolution and the unfolding of forms is most visible in Series 6, Shield of Morella, which I'll show on the screen. And this uh, sculpture incorporates direct references to fossilized forms from an extinct evolutionary past. Uh, based on Morella Splendens, the first and most common fossil found in the Burgess Shale, Rubinoff's Shield of Morella is an elegant interpretation of the arthropod from which it was inspired. No, there's the fossil... Uh, that the sculptures uh, derive from. Uh, a sense of movement and fragility is conveyed by the sculpture's uh, long, thin, corten steel stem that vibrates uh, in the wind, emulating the same fragility of the tiny marine arthropod. Yet there is also a strength afforded to the sculpture, which is more than 30 times larger than its arthropodic equivalent. <laughs> this enlargement magnifies the importance of Morella Splendens in both the Burgess Shale discovery, and in evolutionary time. 
What's more, the rusted aesthetic of Core 10 uh, lends the sculpture a kind of maturity which reflects the age of its subject. Shield of Morella is the fourth piece in Series 6, uh, and Rubinoff was originally uh, reticent to ascribe any narrative hint, hint to the group, but he made an explicit reference to the Burgess Shale with uh, Shield of Morella in order to draw attention to the, quote, unusual and organic unfolding of the works in the series. Separated by more than 505 million years, Rubinoff's Morella offers a direct link uh, between the evolutionary past and present, a compression of time that offers up a metaphor of creative explosion that is essential not just to Series 6, but to his entire body of work. In addition to the visual metaphor derived from the shield of Morella, the fabrication and casting of each sculptor also symbolize the evolutionary inspiration of the series. As Jeffrey has described to me and what I find fascinating is that the technology for melting and casting steel is distinct from casting other sculptural materials such as iron, bronze, and aluminum, all of which melt at or below uh, 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. However, steel melts at 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit and is poured over 300 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which uh, Jeffrey describes as akin to pouring liquid light at the very formation of our planet. The amount of energy required to cast steel echoes, uh, at a biological level, the process of fossilization, in which high temperatures caused by geological compression fix the imprint of an organism in time. And likewise, after pouring small quantities at such high temperatures, steel, too, freezes. The reward of such technical, yet dangerous, work is the ability to construct any shape, from cubes and tubes to the severe spheres and organic abstractions seen in series 6, 7, and 8. And what's more, the material with which Rubinoff sculpts also reflects the arthropodic material of the organisms he imagines. The high tensile strength of steel allows Rubinoff to create smaller nodes and joints within his sculptures, similar to the refined joints in arthropods that too possess high tensile strength. Because Rubinoff considers his work since the 1980s as essentially arthropodic, the Burgess Shale was a logical metaphor, a metaphorical link. Although the Cambrian explosion documented in the Burgess fossils suggests a rapid diversification of life, it also highlights the missing links between organisms across evolution. Fossil records are absent during most of Earth's early geological history because climatic conditions were not conducive to the formation of fossilized parts and life had not yet evolved materials that could be fossilized. The Burgess discovery is significant because it is one of the earliest points at which climate, geology, and evolution converge to preserve a record of life despite that record being incomplete. And like the missing fossil record, Jeffrey felt as if he too was missing transitions from one original sculpture to the next. An instructive example of this evolution of sculptural form is Series 7, Hunter 1, which, as you can see on the screen above, in which a metaphor of embedded bone is introduced by casting parts in stainless steel and welding them on, into a Corten steel armature. The distinction between rusted Corten and silver stainless steel is clearly expressed through Hunter 1, a vivid abstraction of a fossilized form. The preceding sculptures in Series 6 do not directly foreshadow this sculptural modification, but this adaptation invites the viewer to imagine the possible permutations and steps missing between each work. Hunter 1 provides an additional, additional metaphor of fossil embedded rock. The visual contrast between core 10 and stainless steel gives the impression of an organic form emerging directly from the fossilized ground below. And the fusion of stainless steel to core 10 in the rest of series 7 also hints at the further refinement and development of sculptural form uh, to come in series 8, where core 10 is no longer present. The sculptural succession of series 6, 7, and 8 hints at what is left behind, metallic uh, skeletal forms of organisms that seem familiar yet mysterious. The Burgess fossils too emerge as complex, well-developed ancestral creatures that fail to persist, adapting strangely familiar forms that also appear abstract. 
these naturally occurring sculptures trace nothing less than the origins of life. As such, series 6, 7, and 8 appear as organic remnants of evolutionary history and invoke a visual kinship between the structures of the body and the forms of our fossilized animal predecessors. And in this manner, Rubinoff has been extending the history of art into deep, uh, deep into evolutionary theory, through which we are reminded both of the creative explosion of life and the extinction implicit in these fossils. Many scientists accept the idea that humans are as much a chance of nature as a product of orderly evolutionary development. And the Burgess Shale signals an essential link between our genetic record and the geological record of Earth, underscoring the bond between life and death, speciation and extinction. And this creative destructive force is a powerful element in Rubinoff's outlook, as he has described, quote, without life there is no witness to this awesome and terrifying creative unfolding of the universe. Rubinoff's sculpture and its connections to evolutionary origins bring greater focus to understanding his affinity with nature. While sculpture parks and gardens have traditionally played a secondary role to their setting, the Jeffrey Rubinoff Sculpture Park is a pronounced departure from this trend. During guided sculpture tours with the artists, as many here can attest, Rubinoff's awareness with the natural world is abundantly clear, whether he is stopping to draw attention to certain species of wildlife or describing detailed climate patterns and geological formations of the park. And although the Jeffrey Rubinoff Sculpture Park is a landscape whose primary purpose is to permanently house and display the work, the area also indirectly satisfies the fundamental elements of a protected area for the conservation of biodiversity and natural resources. Protected areas uh, vary widely in size, location, management approaches, and objectives, and sculpture parks are no exception. Rubinoff's purpose-built park protects habitat, albeit altered by humans, such as forest riparian zones of migratory birds, and provides an important buffer for the adjacent Mount Jeffrey National or Nature Park, a regionally managed protected area recognized for its unique coastal Douglas fir ecozone. Protected forms in any permutation, however, are not a panacea for conservation, and many limitations plaguing protected areas in the past have been well documented and impel new and alternative models of conservation. A foremost limitation to protected areas in their traditional North American construction is the implicit separation of humans from nature. Uh, we're all probably familiar with parks in this conception, and in fact, the Burgess Shale falls within a national park, Yoho National Park, which separates humans from nature in many ways. This dichotomy is problematic because it serves to further entrench the popular conceptions of wilderness as places untouched by humans. The Jeffrey Rubinoff Sculpture Park, however, challenges this dualism by placing art with, within a natural surrounding that both accentuates the landscape and is activated by it. Sculpture parks and other novel models of protected areas are beginning to regain favor uh, within the conservation community as important tools to safeguard both natural and cultural ecosystem services. Scientists posit that by redesigning anthropogenic habitats, such as agricultural land, so that their use is compatible with biodiversity, we can reverse the rapid loss of biodiversity. The protection of biodiversity and ecosystem services may, interestingly enough, uh, depend on the associated protect protection of cultural elements. By this function, the Jeffrey Rubinoff Sculpture Park incidentally plays a role in the conservation of biodiversity and ecological processes on Hornby Island. And through its long-term vision and management as a park legally protected, the site fulfills the formal requirements of a protected area. Rubinoff Sculpture Park does not only possess an intrinsic value afforded by the works it contains, but it assumes additional significance by virtue of its value as an area that protects a globally significant ecoregion. In short, the Sculpture Park has the potential to improve understanding and appreciation of the unique ecology of British Columbia. So the, dy the dynamic relationship between nature and culture in Rubinoff's work uh, park and outlook highlights the important exchange of knowledge gained by art. 
the Sculpture Park invites us to reconsider the distinction between nature and culture and to reinterpret their contested meanings. The nature-culture relationship has often been portrayed as a dualism in which humans are distinctly separate from the natural world. Recent scholarship, as I've touched on today, has challenged the traditional separation between what is natural and what is cultural. And Rubinoff's own outlook reflects this contemporary understanding of this continuum. His sculptures are not simply about art, but echo a larger connection to the natural world through their inseparable relationship with their site, where meaning is not just ascribed to the work, but also extended to its setting. The work becomes ingrained in its natural landscape and engenders particular insights on our own evolutionary history. In this manner, nature and culture in the park work in counterpoint, where tensions of the artwork are reconciled and harmonized in one's mind. For Rubinoff, an artist has a unique ability to perceive counterpoint and absorb paradoxes between contradictory ideas. From the forces of creation and destruction manifested in the Burgess fossils, to the careful placement of each sculpture in visual counterpoint with what Rubinoff describes as, quote, the crushing environment of Hornby Island. Although Rubinoff's decision to exhibit his work in the immediacy of nature suggests a juxtaposition of nature and culture, a more nuanced look at his work and artistic practice reveals a larger connection, including his propensity for Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And as is evidenced by the sculpture park, the boundaries between nature and culture are socially constructed and vary over different scales, both temporal and spatial. This social construction of nature and culture does not reduce the value of each, but instills a greater understanding of the interplay between them. Rubinoff's art and the insights that evolved from the work explore this nexus between humans and the environment and comments on our ever-evolving relationship to the natural world. And I'll finish with a, a, a quote from uh, the conservation biologist William Adams, which uh, summarizes this anthropic sensibility. Quote, when we expect to see pristine, unaffected nature free from all human influence, what we see is a reflection of our ideas, our longings, our own attempt to separate the natural from the cultural. And so it is with art, its epistemic value, I argue, risks being reduced by the attempt to separate culture from nature. Through his engagement with natural history, Rubinoff continues to expound art as a source of knowledge as he continues to work relentlessly at the fringe of the forest. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think we'll probably limit it to just a few questions or comments and then go to lunch. Does anybody... Have anything they'd like to add? Jeffrey, do you have anything? You'd... No, I think that uh, okay. that was very interesting. In fact, <clears throat> if we look at the book, we just see the diversity of response that I really appreciate in the book itself. So I thought it was great. Uh, it was terrific. Um, I just wanted to go back <clears throat> to David's comment about he said the exquisite counterpoint with the environment that's found um, within the sculptures. And um, I want to... Okay, okay. We've got timelines um, that are involved in the placement of sculpture and then the expressive lines of the sculpture themselves. So all the different considerations that are taking, taken into the placement of the sculptures and the, the wonderful way... I was very struck... Um, Jeffrey, by what you said before about how you're responding to the landscape and the lines of the landscape, the, the Beaufort Mountains. Um, I wanted, I was just wondering if you could tie this into what you also mentioned earlier, the idea of lifeline, so, which I heard as being derived from the Chauvet Caves. And this is a lot to tie in together, but I'm hearing this. I, I want to, if, if you can tell me if the source of the idea of lifeline is based on intuition and how you come to the idea of perhaps bringing it all together with also responding to the lines of the geography, which is the first time I've ever heard it said in a European context. So I'm, I, I, I'm hoping my question makes sense. I'm trying to bring in a lot of elements, but that's what you're doing here. 
anyway, uh, so. Um, for one thing, we're not, we're not seeing the Beaufort range today. So it, it's very much more radical, but not pointy the way the mainland mountains are, which are like far more jagged and sawtooth. These have that wonderful organic shape of the, of the lifeline. And from a distance, when, you, when you're on the water, uh, Hornby looks like a whale. You know, it has a, a lifeline that sits like that, the, the mountain of, in the shape of Hornby Island. So those are omnipresent. So that's part of the recognition and the understanding why a geometric form can work in counterpoint with the environment and the imposition of human beings within that environment is not a destructive force. Whereas if the sun came out and it was clear, we'd see the destructive force of human beings throughout the mountain ranges, less so now on Mount Jeffrey because it's, pr it's protected. But it's constantly going on that the lice are eating uh, the trees on, on Vancouver Island. You can see just what that imposition is. So I wanted to reverse the sense that we get in BC that this is a gold rush mentality that we have, that we pick it up and take advantage of the environment no matter where we are, and instead deal with the history of art itself on how human beings can impose themselves in this environment as part of it rather than a destructive force. So the lifelines that are so strong that I see within the, within the mountains themselves there's, it can only be slightly redefined uh, on the landscape the way that I see it with, with that imposition of counterpoint uh, 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 of the human mind within it so that the organic pieces remain really small and you have to be able to look at each one in terms of the entire context of what it is but it's not the statement itself it's not like a giant Henry Moore sculpture stuck out here. I don't think that that would work here at all, that this is not, not the object of how it worked. It took me years to be able to live in the environment and feel out how a human being might relate to this environment without making a very human statement, without making a destructive statement. And, uh, and so the pieces, I hope, successfully make that statement. So you're saying the lifeline, yeah, most people don't think of that as the lifeline. But if you are working in counterpoint with the geometric sense that human beings can form a geometric configuration culturally within this environment and can do so in such a way that it doesn't represent the destruction of the environment, but rather the counterpoint within the environment of the human being being here, then to me that's a successful piece. So you have to count for the lifelines. The lifelines sit there. Unfortunately, they're not nearly as visible as, as they normally are here. That's a revolutionary act. <laughs> well, the lifeline also exists within the, the treetops. You know, if we look at how the trees and the different sizes all work out, they're all different timelines. And there are timelines that I participated in because I replanted the, the, the farm. It was in its south, west, and north configuration. It was cleared fence post to fence post. And so this has all been replanted in this period of time since I've been here. And so each uh, cluster of trees represents a different timeline. And if you look at the tops of the trees and how they move, you'll find the regaining of that lifeline again. So it's even more proximate than the mountains themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you think might be the key to developing, for you, what, was, what was the key to developing the intuition that must have been involved in working with so many different timelines? Um, it was realizing that the first pieces that were built for a white cube environment were internal, that the, that the internal, the elements of counterpoint were internal to those pieces. But when those pieces were brought out here, suddenly all of it 
had to be taken into account, that a piece just couldn't be placed simply because it looked pretty where it was, but rather it had to account for this entire environment in 360 degrees. So it's one of the things that I, I, I don't know how, how Karun discussed it yesterday, but as soon as you enter, even in the parking lot, everything that's done within a sculptor's environment is done in 360 degrees. So it's a consciousness of the entire environment in 360 degrees, rather than just the focus of, of, of looking at it. And that's a really significant difference between outdoor sculpture and painting, in that painting focuses us within that two-dimensional plane, just as the photograph that's up on here. Whereas you can't do that as a sculptor. And so the accounting for the place aesthetically takes years and years and years. I travel it every day, except until I got my leg uh, damaged. But I would travel it every day and travel it in different directions all the time. And I became very conscious that even like a day like today is actually quite a beautiful day because it's changed the entire environment as to how the pieces themselves relate. So it's a bit unfortunate that what happens when we do the forums is that there's only a couple of days, whatever they happen to be here. But in living it and every day, I kind of am conscious of it all the time. And I, I've worked with, uh, with John Kirk and uh, now with uh, John M., the, the, the person who's replaced him, will be working on this all the time. We pick up, I pick up things that I've never seen before and we change them or don't change them. We have to make a decision about that. But there's been my hands on every bit of this environment. And, and, and when it works, it's because you're not aware of it. You know, it's the landscape you don't see is the very best landscaping, in my opinion. Thank you for your thoughtful response. <laughs> I think we're going to have to cut off the questions, but there's lunch, so if you have anything else you want to discuss with Jeffrey, please do so, and hopefully you can stay for a little bit. Well, I'm going to take a break. For okay. If I can okay. Ready to drive Thank you very much. That concludes today.